being the, you know, even after 10 years, I still cannot believe, it sounds really stupid, but I still cannot believe that this species exists. And when I see one, I am blown away by it, just as the first time. Because you see, most of the work we do is with indirect evidence. Radio telemetry, you hear beeps, you don't see them. Camera traps, you don't see them. So, you know, a couple of times a year during captures when we're in the presence of them, you know, they just blow your mind away. They are, they are incredible. They're an incredible, incredible species. This episode is brought to you in part by our sponsor, Tidal Influence, a Californian ecological consulting firm who proudly supports environmental education and all of the diverse conservation efforts that Pelicanus works to highlight. Visit their website at tidalinfluence.com to learn more about what they do to conserve our coastal resources and how you can get involved. Hello everyone and welcome to Pelicanus. Pelicanus is a nonprofit organization focused on sharing the movement that is and has been happening in the conservation field. Now this is Conservation Conversations, our long-form documentary-style show that highlights the people and organizations that are making it their purpose to grow the conservation field and to show that people have and still are making monumental differences in our world with intentional change. Head over to pelicanus.org to find all of our episodes and more. In this episode, we talk to Dr. Arnaud Debier, biologist and project coordinator for the Giant Armadillo Project and the Ant Eaters and Highway Project in the Pantanal region of Brazil. These projects aim to study, conserve, and protect these two iconic species. You can visit the websites for these programs at giantarmadillo.org and giantanteater.org. Now, let's get to know Dr. Debbie A. So, with that, do you mind, um, I guess, kind of introducing yourself, um, kind of saying where you're from, and then we can kind of get into your work after that? So my name is Arnaud Debier. I'm currently uh, the president and founder of a small Brazilian NGO called ICAS, which is the Institute for the Conservation of Wild Animals, Instituto de Conservação de Animais Silvestres. Um, I have been in Brazil now 18 years, but originally I am French. I was born in Paris, actually, and due to my father's job, I lived both half my life in the United States and half in, um, in France. Um, I went to university in Canada, um, at McGill University, where I studied zoology, um, and then got a master's in natural resource management in the UK, and then PhD also in the UK. Um, and I, I worked, uh, I like to say that I was born in a zoo because my first job when I was 16 was uh, as a zookeeper. And I worked um, for, for two, two different parks. When I, when I even graduated from university, I, 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 started, I went back to working in a zoo. So, so that I've learned a lot from, from that experience. But then I wanted to really wanted to work with animals in the wild. And that kind of took me on this crazy journey of working in different countries and different places. I worked and lived in oh, the UK, Argentina, Bolivia, Belize, Nepal. And, and, and now I've really settled in, 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 in uh, Brazil, which has really become my home. Um, and when I say my home, it's really the Pantanal, because I've been living 18 years in the, um, in the state of Mato Grosso do Sul, um, working in the Pantanal. I'm now married and have two kids and two dogs. That, uh, that was a lot. That was <laughs> way more countries than I would have uh, ever guessed. <laughs> With that background, you kind of are, have a, a global mindset. And as you mentioned, you kind of have switched to where now the Pantanal is your home for almost 20 years. But what was it about the, the two species that you worked on that kind of made you uh, settle down in a way uh, professionally? I, I really fell in love with the Pantanal as soon as I got here. So um, actually when, when Patty and I decided to get married and that I would live in Brazil, she came and moved, she works with, she, she is the world's specialist on tapers actually and she was working in the Atlantic forest and so the idea was that um, I, I'll move to Brazil but you come to the Pantanal because the Pantanal is really an extraordinary place. Um, it's the world's largest freshwater wetland and it's it's located in the center of the South American continent. One of the most extraordinary things about the Pantanal is how little people know about the Pantanal. Um, it, it's this huge area, 140 uh, square uh, thousand square kilometers. Nestled, most of it is in is is in um, 
is in Brazil, but, but there a little bit is in Paraguay and Bolivia. But this area is kind of like the melting pot of South America. So you find low endemism, which means that there's few species that only occur there, but there's a high diversity. And not only is there a high diversity, but it's the place where you find healthy populations of a lot of endangered species. So the world's um, highest concentration in, uh, in densities of jaguars, highest in macaws, uh, giant river otters, all these species are found in healthy numbers in the Pantanal. Pampas deer, marsh deer, lots of these species, the highest density recorded of giant armadillos is found in the Pantanal. So, so here you have a biome that really concentrates a lot of these species. Um, it's, the vegetation is absolutely extraordinary because it's a mix of Amazon, Chaco, Atlantic Forest, Cerrado vegetation. Um, so you have, it, it's just beautiful. And the best part for me, one of my favorite things of the ecosystem and why I'm in love with this biome is that 95% of the Pantanal is privately owned and is, in, is divided into these um, private cattle ranches. And it's one of the few examples of a tropical ecosystem where man is present. Mm. And how has, well, how has the Pantanal survived in an almost pristine manner all these, all these last 250 years? It's because the, the, only, uh, the main economic activity is, um, is extensive cattle ranching. And that basically means that you have cattle in these extensive areas foraging on the native pasture. Because you see when the flooding season comes, um, the, uh, the cubs, uh, every, uh, everything is covered in water, but when it recedes, all those areas are grasslands. And so that provides a lot of feed for, for natural pastures for, for cattle. For, for cattle. Uh, that, I, that is really my favorite part of the Pantanal. When I first came here, I came to work on pigs and peccaries, studying the, uh, the invasive species, which is the, the feral pig and how um, the niche overlap with the native peccaries, but also the use by the native population of, um, of, the, of this feral pig, which is extraordinary because actually this is one of the few areas where feral pigs are not such a threat because um, they, they are actually an outlet for the cowboys and people who live in the Pantanal to hunt. So it's kind of almost a win-win, you know, people don't hunt the native species because they have this invasive species present. Um, and then I moved to looking at forage resources and looking at um, the gold of the Pantanal, which is actually grasses, right, the native grass. And so looking at these diversity of species, because we don't know very much about all that. And then what happened is, um, I was always in love with armadillos. All my life I loved armadillos and my wife told me that the ranch she worked, she spotted a giant armadillo, and that was a species I've always crazy to see. I went to put a few camera traps in, in the ranch where she was working, and then when I caught my first picture, a glimpse of the species, if you will, I was um, completely transformed. This is, you know, there, then and there I decided to change everything I was doing and dedicate my life to this species. It is really, as you said, it's a weird animal, but it's an extraordinary species. Um, and, you know, I can talk for hours about giant armadillos and they really, really changed my life and everything I do. And from a one man show, just putting a few camera traps, we now have our own NGO with 10 full time staff about, I think by, we, we must have about 15 students um, and about 30 collaborators. So it became this huge movement around, uh, around the giant armadillos and then later on the giant anteater, um, which, but, 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 which is for the biodiversity of Brazil you know, fighting for, to maintain. So these are actually turned out to be, we use them as flagship species to address threats, but it's not just for that species, it's also for um, the rest of biodiversity. I, I have to admit, I honestly, when I started looking up for research for this, I, I was, I've heard of the Pantanal, but I don't really know what it is. And when I was looking into it, it does seem like a very special place. And, you know, your, your enthusiasm for it kind of comes out uh, pretty well. So could you describe the species the giant armadillos uh, to begin with, if you want, and have the mindset, I guess, of talking to us like we're fifth graders, <laughs> and just so you can kind of explain, so, you know, what they do, how they interact, you know, the, the ecology of it, everything. Well, what much more, in, in, in North America, at least, what most, most people do not know is that there are actually 20 different species of armadillo. The what? one that you know about is the nine-banded armadillo, as it occurs in Texas, in the southern states of the United States. 
Um, but there are actually so 20 species wow. of armadillo. And the giant armadillo, as its name actually uh, indicates, is the largest of them all. They are uh, five feet from the tip of their nose to the tip of their tail. Um, and they weigh about uh, 80 pounds. <laughs> so they're about, I like to joke that they're about the size of, of a, a, a Labrador retriever. They are characterized by, of course, this big armor, which, which is the characteristic, characteristic of all armadillo species, but also these huge claws on their, on their front paws. The third digit, which has the, the, these uh, a really elongated claw, which they use to uh, dig up ants and termite nests. It's a species that's fairly well distributed through South America. They are found from Venezuela to Northern Argentina. Um, in several different ecosystems, they're found in the Amazon, they're found in the Cerrado, the Atlantic forest. This is just the dogs playing, sorry. Um, but this is the hell they are all day. Yeah. Um, uh, Chaco and of course the Pantanal. However, almost nothing was known about this species when we started uh, this project. And that's because despite being well distributed, the giant armadillo, wherever they occur, are very rare. They naturally occur at low densities. And, and of course, also they're rare, be and, and also their behavior, they're solitary and nocturnal. They spend all day deep underground in their burrows. Uh, their burrows are very deep also. Um, they can be several feet deep and, and very wide. And so they spend all day, and, and they go, come out about on average for five hours a day. A night, sorry. Okay. And then they forage on ants and termites, and then they dig a new burrow, and, and, or they can use the same burrow. But they have also these really huge home ranges, which are 25 square kilometers. I'm not sure what that is in miles. Um, but it's the size of Central Park, basically. What is really interesting also with this species is that this is a species we knew almost nothing about, that people rarely see. However, they play a very important role in the ecosystem. Because you see these burrows, which they spend all day sleeping in, um, they, dig, they dig them in about 20 minutes. They're really easy. So although they're really large and deep, they can dig them pretty rapidly. And then these burrows are used by other species. And we've documented over 70 species using these burrows as a refuge against extreme temperatures, as a place to hide against predators, as a place to forage. Um, over 70 species use giant terminal burrows. So they are what we call ecosystem engineers. Um, they provide homes for other species. This is kind of like the role in North America that the beaver plays. A beaver builds, build, cut, fells trees, builds dams, and creates a whole new ecosystem, right? A small lake that benefits lots of other species. And this role of giant armadillos has been demonstrated in the um, Peruvian Amazon, in Colombia, in the Atlantic Forest, in the, in the Chaco of Argentina. So several researchers have now demonstrated this role. So that's what, so this is a species we knew very little bit about, little about, people hardly ever see, and yet it plays a really important role in the ecosystem, providing homes for other species. So when you saw them for the first time and you decided that you wanted to, to study them, uh, what, what did you discover is the conservation issue facing uh, these, obviously these very important, this very important species? Well, giant armadillos face uh, various threats and that really depends on the location. And that's why we started working the Pantanal, but we have now expanded our project to the uh, scrub grasslands of the Cerrado, Atlantic Forest, Argentinian Chaco, because depending on the place where you work, the threats will be different. In, in the Pantanal, the main threat is, um, is habitat loss and also fires. In the Atlantic Forest, the main threat that we documented was hunting. In, um, in the Cerrado, uh, scrub, uh, the grasslands of the Cerrado, the main threat is um, habitat loss, and also a conflict with beekeepers that have been, um, that retaliate against predation of their beehives. In the Chaco, it's, it's habitat loss. In the Amazon, it's habitat loss and hunting. So depending on the biome and the place where you work, 
you'll have to mitigate against the different threats. But basically, giant armadillos, they face the main threat, the same threats as most of our, the neotropical species. Um, so habitat loss, hunt, poaching, um, roadkill, I forgot to mention, which is also a threat, um, and, 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 and so far and so forth. And, and you know, human, a, a little bit of conflict, a little bit of lack of knowledge and superstitions, these kinds of things. I can imagine if you see one of those for the first time, it, it's not a, a great omen if they're in your house. <laughs> But for some people, it brings, yeah, so some people say in the Pantanal, and we've heard some people in the Cerrado say that too, is that they believe the giant armadillo can bring bad luck. So if you see one, somebody in the ranch will die in, in next year. So we've been very careful every time when we have captures, we bring people to see them. And that's something that we found that with um, a lot of outreach work and talking about the species, we've kind of reverted to, if you see a giant armadillo, you're really lucky because few people ever had the chance to see them. And so when you say that you were transformed and, and you wanted to dedicate your time and your life from here on out to studying them, what does that mean? Like what kind of research uh, are you conducting? And yet it seems like you're conducting them all over the place in all different habitats with a huge team now, which is awesome that you've grown to that size. But uh, what, what, is the, um, what are the methods and what does that actually look like day to day? So yeah, so depending on the project day to day, it will look like something really different. I'll, I'll, I'll start from the beginning. I really started out just setting out camera traps to try to identify and find the giant armadillo. And we did that by placing camera traps in front of giant armadillo burrows. Now, although giant armadillos are really rare, difficult to see, they do have one thing that's very practical about them. And it's that um, you can see their, their armor, they have a gray armor, but they have this white band at the edge of the armor. Also, their, their, um, their back legs, the scales on their back legs have different patterns between white and gray. Um, and the scales on their foreheads and even on their tail, they have lots of detail that you can analyze and identify uh, individuals through these different, uh, through these um, scales, colors or patterns of their scales. And so um, through that, you can identify individuals and follow them. Um, so that's the first thing we did. How many armadillos are there? Are there several of them? So that's one of the practical things about giant armadillos is that you can really, you can identify them. And so once we knew that this, there were animals in the area, then I started working with a veterinarian, Daniel Kleber, and together well, we had to figure out how to capture the animal. And so that took a long time. Then another biologist, Gabriel Masocato, joined the team and we started studying the basic ecology of the species. And that was that we started doing that in the pristine Pantanal. So the Pantanal is, is kind of like our laboratory, if you will. This, that's where we study the natural uh, history of the species. So we can get the basic data on the animal. And then we expanded the project to other areas, those different biomes, so the Cerrado, the Atlantic Forest, the Chaco, where we study then the particular threat. So then those other projects are more threat-based where um, the, the Pantanal projects are more um, uh, na national history based, if you will. And then as the project grew, the team grew. And then we, you know, the uh, sample collection objectives changed, looking at health, looking at genetics. In 2018, we also realized the importance of education and communication. And we realized that while we were vets and biologists doing that, so we worked in different schools, we gave lots of different talks, we realized that we were unable to really evaluate our work and we were unable to really judge if we were being efficient. All the work we had kind of done up until now was opportunistic. So even though we did several campaigns with uh, zoos in Brazil, with different schools and everything, we were, we wondered how effective we work. So then we, we put together this big workshop to create a strategic plan for education and communication. And that really also transformed the project, which means that we now, we hired an educator and then a second educator. And now, and then we really put together like a strong education component, which enables us to really target the work we're doing. Not only target, but also evaluate and get feedback. And so from, from you know, biologists and, and veterinarians trying to do communication education, we really realized that no, we need professionals to do this. So that really also expanded the project. And so, um, and students, they tackle, you know, special questions and they, they can look at, investigate this. So it really became, you know, a big, um, I guess a huge puzzle, right? With lots of different people trying to do different things. 
And my job from being a field worker, initially a field worker, is now, I guess, um, kind of a manager of, these, of the, all these different people and these different initiatives and keeping everybody working together, communicated, and focusing more time now on actually public, changing public policies and, and trying to um, work with uh, different authorities to you know, really uh, implement the changes that we would like to see. And although I still go to the field, I go less often now. Um, our teams, we have a really a solid team of people. And I, so I'm going in to the Panta now in a week, but I, instead of going for the whole two weeks, I only go for one week. Um, and then I, the week after I go for the for giant anteaters where I will just place some collars on. But most of the time not needed now, the team does the work perfect that I go there because it's what I love to do. And, and everybody knows that I need to do this for, um, um, I guess to, to you know to, to I guess to keep it real also um, that's where I can really think about everything we do find the inspiration to keep working um, and, and and just be motivated by all the conversations we can have with our team with the students with the volunteers because um, you, you need all this constant feedback of the field of the animals being the presence of the animals but also always talking to everybody um, talking to people in the local communities who, who live with these animals all these things are very important. It seems as if your program has um, evolved since the beginning. Like you said, it went from just setting out a few camera traps and, and just being excited to see them to now uh, you kind of have bigger, bigger plans to learn everything you can about the species, um, but also save them as, as best you can. You kind of already mentioned a little bit, but what are the future goals of, of this project? It's, it sounds like you've gone in a lot of different directions, but what are the overall future goals for the pro project? The vision that I would like to see is I would like to ensure that we have viable populations of giant armadillos and giant anteaters in the different biomes where they naturally occur in the long term. And so to fulfill that vision, that means that we need, we need um, to work in, in these different natural habitats, in these different biomes. But it also means, so it, it also means having strategic goals for each diff of the different areas. And so for each, of the, for each different um, biome, we set different targets and different goals. And those targets have also their research goals, their education communication goals. They're also um, uh, public policy goals where we try to you know, work with authorities to change these threats. And so um, that's why it's important to have such a big multidisciplinary team where we all work together so you can have people targeted on, on all this, on, on very tackling a specific issue. So for the anteaters and highways, we, um, because it's a species that's better known, we really focused on the issue of roadkill. For the armadillos, we really kind of focus uh, we have um, every biome has different threats, but so we have kind of like sub projects and each sub project has a different but well established target. Um, and so it's very important that, we, but we all still have to work together. Tomorrow, for example, we have a meeting, all the NGO, all, everybody together where we meet on Zoom for an hour and a half and everybody, um, we usually have a guest speaker. Often it's one of the students presenting what the work is doing, but we also present everything we're doing. So we all, although everybody has very targeted um, objectives and goals that they need to fulfill, we, are, we do integrate our work a lot so that everybody feeds off the experience of each other. Um, to just to try to answer your question, each, uh, each of the different um, sub projects, if you will, has a specific goal. But the overarching role is that we have viable populations of these of the giant armadillo and giant anteater in the different biomes of, of, of Brazil that, that, that survive in the future. And also we want, and to do that, we also want, of course, the population, local people, everybody to highly respect and value these species and that these species uh, play an important role, feel that they play an important role in the ecosystem. I think that's some, uh a theme that we've seen a lot with the conversations we had is is uh, collaboration and it's it's always great to hear when people say hey, i have a great relationship with all my my partners and we all work together really well so it's always great to see that just because it is so important well i guess do you if you don't mind could we kind of take a step back and then kind of do the same description of uh the species for the anteaters so we can kind of go into that uh, project as well and anteaters are probably what I think one of the most iconic species of South America. 
Uh, most people recognize them and, and know about them. But the giant anteater, I think, is one of the most majestic and also strange looking species. They have this long tubular uh, snout. They walk on their knuckles like a gorilla. They have this, you know, this shaggy appearance, this big shaggy tail, which kind of brushes on the ground. Uh, mothers carry their pups on their backs. So people recognize them. They are very iconic species and they're well distributed in South America. They also go up a little bit into Central America. But this is also a species that, although they are just classified as, they are classified as vulnerable to extinction. This is a species that is going locally extinct in several areas. And the main threat to giant anteaters, one of the main threats to giant anteaters in the state where I live is uh, roadkill. So we started working with giant anteaters in 2013 in the Pantanal where we put some radio collars, 15 radio collars on, on wild giant anteaters, once again to look at how they behaved in the pristine Pantanal. But at the same time, we did some road surveys in 2013, 2014, and we realized that giant anteaters were the third most killed species um, in, in our state. And so we, we uh, surveyed biweekly, um, I think 900 kilometers of highways, and, and they were the third most killed. And that was really scary because they're a large mammal. That they have a pup, only one pup a year. And so how can, such a, you know, how can these big mammals withstand such a huge threat? And so um, once we got those results, we started preparing the project. And in 2017, the Anteaters and Highways project was born. And that was really a big multidisciplinary project, really trying to tackle, understand first where, when, and how um, giant anteaters cross the road and how can we tackle this threat. So we, we worked on road surveys, another three years of road surveys to understand pinpoint where the hotspots are, why is this occurring? We put radio collars on over 50 uh, giant anteaters. We worked with uh, truck drivers doing a, a study on their perception. Um, there was this belief that truck drivers purposely uh, hit giant anteaters because they thought they brought bad luck. No, honestly, results of we have a PhD student that tackled that question. That wasn't. That is not true. They tackled them because because uh, they can't avoid it. Um, we looked at density of giant anteaters close and far from roads. Another PhD uh, tackled that, placing 180. Uh, uh, camera trap locations near and far from roads to try to understand how this happens. Um, we we worked on health. We caught, we we did necropsies on over 70 carcasses of giant anteaters to understand health. We looked at genetics, compared genetic sample, had a geneticist um, look look at um, first of all sex the animals that from that were that were found the carcasses because you can't always tell when you have a, a dried carcass, uh, but also look at how it's impacting uh, genetic diversity. We had, well, we looked also, we uh, used the, the, um, the, the necropsies also to do new uh, studies on their morphology, uh, reproductive morphology. So lots and lots and lots of questions. So it, this was really, you know, a project that took a village. And in that sense, I really was just kind of steering the boat. This was the project that really changed kind of my life because I went from, running the project and actually capturing all the giant anteaters to really just coordinating all these different people and, and different things because there's so many different specialties, so many different people collaborating together towards this one goal. And now we're starting the second phase of the project next January where the focus, we have a long-term study on the animals that will still continue where we're, we're putting, we keep collars on females to look at um, reproductive success, pup mortality and these kinds of <coughs> questions. Um, but we're really now diving into the um, human, the, the human uh, political and, uh, d uh, and uh, um, institutional dimensions of wildlife vehicle collisions. So um, bringing, lo looking at how we can work with governments, but also truck companies and individual truck drivers. So we, we're really moving a, a, a away from a little bit the field research to, to having a more social, social, social research in action. And this project is being led by, um, by three different specialists in, in actually human wildlife conservation, um, uh, human so we call it the human dimensions of wildlife conservation. Um, so I'm really moving away in areas that I'm not even comfortable or knowledgeable about, but just bringing in these people, which I know are really important to those, those, those areas. So really, when you say that conservation is a multidisciplinary science, I mean, yes, that's true. <laughs>
So it seemed as if for the anteater project, you kind of, you, you got the ball rolling and now it's, as it's rolling, it's like a snowball, it's picking up all these different fields and, and different uh, people in different uh, areas all kind of going towards the same thing. I guess in the first three years, it's very early in the, on the project, but what, um, what have you guys been able to find out and, what, and see? Have you seen any uh, impacts on the uh, uh, anteater populations? Are you starting to see less or more uh, uh, roadkill issues? So right now, what we were able to see is no. So we, we in three years, we counted over a thousand carcasses of giant anteaters, um, and we were able to um, really try to address the, uh, understand where, when, and how this occurs. But also, once again, so using giant anteaters as a flagship species, um, so we made many advances on giant anteater ecology, on, on road ecology. Um, but it's also been now uh, a, a, a moment now where it's really starting to. The, the collaborations with the state, with for with federal authorities, with state authorities, and private concessions. Um, and just two weeks ago, I had news that one of the private concession road concessions we're working with will be installing some fences um, to prevent roadkill. So the results are going to take a long time to trickle in. Um, but but it, it's really about a lot of communication, communication, working with authorities to try to implement. Um, mitigation measures. What we are really showing is that we need to get the animals off the road. Um, that, that, you know, the, the, the real issue is that environmental education is important. Sign is are, is are important. But despite all this, um, roadkill still occurs. The truck drivers really illustrate that. They know, um, they know this happens, but there's nothing they can do when the animal is in front. They do not have time to break. They do not have time to swerve or else it will be too dangerous, they can put their lives at risk. Um, now, giant anteaters have also a peculiar, peculiarity is that they are dark. They often start walking, they often are, are active at the, at, at, uh, when, when it's darker. Their eyes do not reflect light. So it's basically kind of a shadow creeping up on the highway. People do not see them, so they do hit them. What we, are, we, we have just submitted a paper right now, which also is showing that if you imp implementing implementing mitigation measures, can save money and uh, the mitigate the, the state and federal authorities can, um, if you will, they can they can make the money back in ten years. The costs of vehicle collisions, of all the uh, physical damage on cars and things that occurs on our roads, if they fence some of the main hotspots, they can get that money back in ten years. And that's not even counting the human tragedies, deaths, and everything that occurred. So what we're really trying to do is prove through science that um, that it makes economic sense to put in mitigation strategies. Not only will it save life, but it will save money. So really trying to adapt our um, our way of exposing the problem or, or talking about the problem, if you will, moving away a little bit from anteaters, but you're really talking also about the human impact. What is it that you found that why are they uh, crossing the road so often? Is it because the road kind of crossed over their natural territory or do they, are, do they, are they attracted to the roads because it's warm or there's uh, prey or something? So we're analyzing the data right now, but it doesn't seem, what, what seems to happen is that, um, that they do not have, that, that the roads don't really, uh, unless the road is really busy, it doesn't really act as a barrier. So a low traffic highway, for example, will be incorporated within the, the, the animal's home range. And so they will cross regularly. Um, and, and then a highway where there's high traffic, they will avoid crossing, uh, well, they'll avoid crossing it. But interestingly, when we compare um, the animal's behavior to natural features such as a stream or something like that, it's, it's, they more or less have the same behavior where they don't cross just as they wouldn't cross a natural stream. So it, it, um, so, so they noise, the, the impact, have busy highways do kind of um, decrease the number of crossings. The problem is that if they do cross a busy highway, they get killed on really quickly. We, we want to try to uh, model the probability of uh, if it's better to live near a busy highway or not busy highway. And in not busy highway, you cross much more, but have a low probability of death. In a very busy highway, you almost never cross, but when you do cross, you almost die. You, you, you almost certainly die. And, and so, um, so for at the so where we're still we're still looking at that, what we are also finding is that they do not use underpasses unless they are guided towards them. They have no aversion to using them, and we've documented that they use underpasses very well. 
but uh, the, but fences are important to try to kind of guide them, if you will, towards the fences. So those are strategies that can really work. Another project we're collaborating with is with orphan, reintroducing orphan giant dentitos back into the wild. So what, when females get hit and die at the edge of the roads, they're orphans of the pup will hang on to dear life. It's very sad because even if the mother is dead, they will not let go. For them, they're oblivious to the rest of the world as long as their mom's back. And so people will sometimes find these highly dehydrated, on the verge of dying baby anteaters, bring them to animal rescue centers. And they can, and once they're under human care, sometimes they can be nursed back to life. But then the question was what to do with them. And we started collaborating with a project called Tamandua Azas that does all the human care part. And we provide them and put on radio collars to try to follow, to try to follow and create best practices for reintroduction. So that project just started last year. We reintroduced three uh, giant anteaters. And right now in the center, they have eight baby giant anteaters that are under human care um, to be released. So in a year. So I guess that's a, a good, uh transition into what we kind of started off with in, in the, the terms of optimism and, and hope. Um, as you kind of mentioned, it's, it's very difficult times right now. Uh, in this, we have a similar situation in, in uh, the US. It can be very difficult at times to feel optimistic and hopeful about the future. Um, but hearing about your, your projects, to me, I, again, I find inspiration the fact that you've been there for 18, 20 years and you've started all these different projects and you've collected all these groups of people in all different fields along the way, all towards saving and conserving and uh, restoring the populations of these two iconic species. So that's what gives me hope is, is you <laughs> and organ people like you and organizations like you. Um, so the question I guess is what gives you hope? Another way to think of it is what is it, where do you go to for inspiration? What do you read? What do you look at? to feel inspired. And it may just be going back out and seeing your animals. So as you mentioned, right now we are, and we have been for, for a while now, um, living a moment that is very, very, um, I would say disheartening to say the least. <laughs> I have to say that the pandemic also shocked me because as a scientist, we saw that even when we're talking about your own life, life of people that they can really identify with, people still don't listen to science. And I think that has been, for me, that was a revelation. It, it really scared me. So that really made me, how can I talk to people about climate change, about long-term impacts that are gonna happen in 20, 50 years if people do not care about something that's going to happen to them in two weeks. <laughs> but what inspires? So how, how do you get over that? I don't think there is a recipe. I mean, there is none. And I have really, really bad days and, you know, some better days. I'm very lucky that I share my life with my wife who works in the same field and we can um, give each other support. Um, but I have to say that what inspires me and keeps me, one of the, what keeps me going is, is actually being with the animals themselves. And so, as I mentioned, I'm going back to the field to work uh, in the Pantanal with giant armadillos. My team does not need me. They know how to do the work perfectly, but I need to go there because I need to be in the presence of a giant armadillo and breathe, smell, just be even just where they walked. Um, you know, this is a species that I have, um, I, I, I don't know, I, I can't really explain it, but I feel, I feel I have a very strong connection to the species. I can't even put into words what they mean to me, but this is a species I care about very, very much. And, and it's a species I feel I have made a promise to, I've made a commitment to that I will give everything I have to. Um, and, and the, and the other thing that inspires me also is the team I work with. I work with the most amazing uh, team of individuals and, and being together in the field and talking, you know, the late nights, just being together is, um, is inspiring. I love, I love the people I work with. They are, they're all heroes to me. I, they, they, they are so, such dedicated members and, and, and 
you know, they really work really, really hard towards this goal. And so when I see, you know, the, their dedication, that also really inspires me. Um, I, I also find inspiration with uh, this, the successes we have, you know, seeing the people engage and seeing that things work, you know, that when you, when you, when you get away from politics and, and authorities and things, when you look at the grassroots level, you can really see effective change and you can see the impact. And in that sense, the environmental education work we do blows my mind away because I see the results we have with, with the school teachers, the dedication that the students put in, the children. I mean, it's, it's, just, it's just crazy. It feels like you can really change the world. So, so you know, that, that really is, is wonderful. And, and, and then you see the commitment of the landowners. The landowners we work with, which really are fighting for the species and biodiversity, which make um, choices that, that are to the benefit of biodiversity and not, econ not their finances or economics, seeing that, I mean, I don't know, it blows my mind away, it inspires me. You know, we were talking about the release of the baby anteaters. Um, one of the landowners where we released uh, uh, a giant anteater, he was so excited, so inspired by the project that he took it upon himself to uh, officially protect and he's, he, um, he created a private protected area. So by law, that area can never be changed. When he died, the land is sold. That area, it, it will always be protected. 300 hectares with a symbol of, of the anteater. Another landowner um, that we worked with, uh, with the Giant Anteater Project also was so inspired by the project that he put a big outdoor sign on the um, highway proclaiming that you know biodiversity conservation was also his goal. And so you see these attitude of all these people and you're like, you know, just to be a part of that, you know, is, is, is really inspiring. Um, I'm currently working on a project to create giant armadillo friendly honey. Um, and then, and so you see the problem is that giant anteaters in the Cerrado, because their areas have been so fragmented that they've learned to um, knock over the honey hive, the beehives of the, in the apiaries of the beekeepers. Uh -huh. And beekeepers are like our, our favorite stakeholder, right? Because they love nature. Yeah. But unfortunately, when these animals start destroying their livelihood, um, they have to retaliate. They end up retaliating. And so sometimes what they do in extreme cases, they apply poison, which kills the giant armadillo. Giant armadillos are so rare that it solves the problem. But it also kills uh, giant anteaters, tyras, the tamanduas, lots of seriema mutum, lots of other species. But what we've done is we've worked with the beekeepers uh, um, and we should look at the mitigation measures that they can put in, in place. And we've described over 11 different methods that can be used, worked with them, we've tested them, we put camera traps out. And now we're working with the uh, authorities. So the uh, government authorities that do the sanitation of the, sanita the sanitation inspections that, that give the license for bee to beekeepers. And We've worked with a, an American company called Wildlife Friendly Enterprise Network. And we've now created these norms that beekeepers have to apply in a contract. And, and the whole work has been so participatory, has been so, the, the local, you know, the government authorities have been so positive, so engaged. The beekeepers have been so engaged because putting in place the mitigation measures does come to a cost to them. It makes their work much harder. But we hope to have the certificate and hope to open up new markets for them. And it was so inspiring to see how everybody has really, you know, come on board of this project, has really um, started working with us. So that was really, that, so that's really inspiring. You see these, you know, everybody really excited about this. The beekeepers ready to put in these sacrifices. Um, once again, we did a social science study and with the, you know, um, beekeepers have a high tolerance to damage. So that means that they, you know, unless it becomes really high, they, they, because they are people that naturally love nature, depend on nature for their livelihood, they accept tolerance. So maybe, um, so, so, so they are very receptive to these mitigation measures. So we've created, um, we have a manual, we have all these things. And I think um, I just got uh, two days ago, really positive feedback from the government authorities. And I think we're going to be able to do our pilot study of cert uh, certifying the first beekeepers very soon in, in uh, uh, end of October, November. So that's really inspiring. That's really exciting to see all these people that believe in the work and want to get on board. And, and so you talk with these individuals, right? And everybody's really excited. And let's say the giant armadillo, they learn about the species. They, they love it. They get excited. And so, so these small successes show you that, you know, 
there are we, we we are making a difference a small difference what i'm seeing is intentional change is inspiring to you, know, you came in and you felt this connection with the species and you wanted to conserve it save it study it and then the local community in any different way many different ways saw that they were inspired to do their own thing and try to help out with that and then that in turn inspires you to, to then have your team grow out and do it again in other areas or just in a more intense way so it's like the success begets success and it's a, a positive feedback loop of inspiration being them you know even after 10 years i still cannot believe it sounds really stupid but i still cannot believe that this species exists and when I see one, I am blown away by it, just as the first time. Because you see, most of the work we do is with indirect evidence. Radio telemetry, you hear beeps, you don't see them. Camera traps, you don't see them. So, you know, a couple of times a year during captures when we're in the presence of them, you know, they just blow your mind away. They are, they are incredible. They're an incredible, incredible species. I think that was my, my first reaction as well. Is like, I, just, I can't even... Uh, imagine why <laughs> how did nature create something like this <laughs> and, and, and what's crazy when you're in the field is that you know they're there but they occur at such low densities you don't know where they are so you have this giant and it's literally under your feet and you don't know where they're just there they're, they're there so how can this species that looks so prehistoric you know, it, it, I always, sometimes I say, it feels like they're thrown back into the places scene in, in, in a time where, you know, the giants, giant uh, glyptodonts and giant sloths ruled South America. Again, the, these species blew my mind and I, I'm, I'm really excited to, you know, explore them further and hopefully eventually we can come down and, and visit the Pantanal and hopefully, you know, see them. As an organization, how how can our viewers find you and maybe or perhaps more importantly help how can we help so what, one of the things that i did not mention in in, uh, in our conversation is that most of our funding comes from zoos in north america and europe ah and so the first thing i would like to ask people that are listening to if you're listening to this right now please go visit your local zoo because due to the pandemic they have lost a lot of their revenue now, not only do zoos provide the best care for their animals, but they also support a lot of conservation projects throughout the world. They support local conservation projects, but also international conservation projects such as ourselves. So go to your local zoo, ask them what they're doing for conservation and help, and help them out. Um, when I talk about people inspiring me, lots of the colleagues we have made um, in, 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 in zoos and uh, the zoos that we have partnered with, we have met some amazing people that are so inspiring also that we work with. And, um, and these zoos have, you know, some of them have been funding us for 10 years. Um, and we've gotten some big grants from foundations and, all, and, and, and such. But really, zoos from small to larger grants have really helped us grow the project, provided expertise and even capacity building for our team. So if, yours, if you want to help us, please help your local zoo because they will help us. And that's important. Um, and so, and they have really been hit hard by the pandemic, but please learn more about, about the work that zoos do. And I know that most people, maybe many people listening to this might be averse to animals living in captivity, might feel, uh, have negative impression about that. But, I, but as a person that works with wild animals, that you know, sees the reality of what it means to live in the wild, work in the wild, live in the wild every day, it's not what you think it is. And the animals that are in AZA accredited zoos have a great life. All their needs, psychological and physical needs are met. Please remember that the data that we are experiencing daily, um, we record, we record in three years over a thousand dead giant anteaters on our roads. Life is not easy. Right now, as I speak to you, 22% of the Pantanal, the place I love and call home, has been burnt and turned to ashes. Giant anteaters, they are basically walking matches. These, this beautiful, you know, hair that you're looking at will be, will, will get on, will, will set on fire very quickly. And they are being uh, cooked and dying. So these zoos that you think, look at the anteaters, look at the animals that are there. They have, zoos strive to give them the highest quality of life. And the welfare that, that they work on, they work to just, they strive to give animals the best welfare possible. 
So please, you know, learn more about zoos, visit your local zoo, get engaged because they are the conservation centers of, of you know, the, your local conservation center. You have to be creative to work with in, in conservation. And I sometimes say when people ask you what you need to do to become a conservationist, a lot of people think about science and, you know, uh, getting uh, academic degrees. And I sometimes think that, that that's not the right way to go because sometimes academia, they kind of force you to think in a certain way. They kind of put you in a box and they kind of train your mind to think a certain way. And, you know, and, and of course, do something that you're good at. So I think that if you're an artist, you know, we, we work with a lot of artists. You were mentioning the logo of our project. That's a very talented artist that came up with that. That speaks to a lot. If you're a lawyer, if you are a storyteller, we need communicators, all these different roles. Conservation is much more than just scientists. So much more, so much more, right? Dr. Davier, thank you again so much for your time. And just to state it again, we are truly inspired by the work you're doing. And uh, yeah, thank you again for your time. We really appreciate it. Well, thank you. I really enjoyed talking talking to both of you. I, I, I it, it brought, uh, made me happy, yeah. So thank you so much. And thank you so much for what you're doing because we need communicators. We need, we need people to get people excited about conservation, realize that conservation is, is, is not just these boring statistics and things that conservation is, is related to everything we do, that it's, that it's important and, and that it's wonderful. And so thanks for, for, for bringing that into people's lives. Thank you so much. It's so important. Thanks again to Dr. Debbie for taking the time to talk with us and for all of the amazing and inspiring work they do to protect the Pantanal and these two amazing and utterly strange species. Please visit their websites and consider donating to them to help protect these species. Thank you again for listening. We'll talk to you next time.